Our final speaker for today, before the past also not to be much of an introduction at all, Joe Ciracioni uh, has been a, a very eloquent voice for a reason. We've been doing the blue weapons pretty much since I was back in diapers, and not only uh, since, not only in uh, his own work, but also through as a leader of the Plowshares Fund by supporting and enabling so much other amazing work that's been happening around the planet. So a warm welcome to Joe. Thank you very much, man. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Max said I had about an hour. <laughs> oh, no. I'm going to try and talk about 15 minutes. Thank you very much for having me, uh, Max. It's been a pleasure meeting you, and thank you very much for uh, uh, coming and for yeah. taking the time. I know we all have lots of things that we could be doing today. I know we have lots of things that, that worry us, challenges we face in our own lives, our families, uh, our cities, our state. But of all the challenges we face, there are only two that threaten destruction on a planetary scale global warming, and nuclear weapons. Both of these are caused by machines that we invented. And both of them threaten to destroy everything else we've invented, including human civilization. Mm -hmm. But both of these can be stopped, mitigated, even reversed. But they both require new ways of thinking, and new leaders with the political courage to take the actions needed to stop these threats before they stop us. When President Obama was elected, we thought we had such a leader. The speech he gave in Prague seven years ago this month was the most sweeping, most promising, most complete, most correct policy speech on nuclear weapons that I've ever heard a president give. I was proud to have served on his national security team during the campaign and to be part of the group that hammered together the nuclear policy that he brought into the White House. And as Secretary Kerry said, in the first two years, he made enormous progress on that agenda. But when the uh, New Star Treaty was finally approved by the Senate at the end of 2010, the nuclear policy team that had been put together, that had started the nuclear security summits, that had hammered out a new nuclear posture review, that had negotiated the treaty with the Russians, that had gotten it through the Senate over stiff resistance, was exhausted. The president turned his attention to other issues. Pressing issues, immigration, the economy, global warming, relations with China, the pivot to Asia, many other issues that required his attention. And when he did so, the nuclear policy agenda started to falter. I just wrote a short article on this for Defense One this week. You can look it up. It's called, Is That All There Is? Hmm. Obama's disappointing nuclear legacy. A reporter from the Los Angeles Times called me up about it. We talked as I was driving to Max's house for lunch yesterday. And he wrote writes, he uses some of my remarks in the Los Angeles Times column today. And it's my short analysis of why this failed. Where is it printed? Why, mm -hmm. despite his major achievements, Obama Something did else. not achieve the policy transformation that we wanted, that we believe is absolutely necessary. And why the incrementalists in his administration won out against the transformationalists. My shorthand for this is the three R's. And we have to understand what went wrong if we're going to have any hope of 
charting out a path for the, the future. And the first and most important reason is the Russians. They stopped wanting to negotiate. That's not true. That's a lie. They stopped wanting to negotiate. I know this for a fact. That's a lie. They that did not true. want to negotiate any more reductions in our nuclear weapons stockpiles. We had a partner in Medvedev. He had the approval of Putin. But as the years dragged on, Putin decided this was not in his interest. This is not what he wanted to do. We couldn't get them to do the next step. You remember, New START was just a stopgap measure. It was just to keep the verification procedures and start going. It was to make a modest trim in the forces, and Medvedev and Putin and, and Obama said it would, there would then be a, another treaty that would make the deep reductions both said they wanted. We never got there. We never got there. I agree with Secretary Perry. We have to keep trying. We have to engage Russia. We cannot secure nuclear materials. We cannot make the reductions that we need in global arsenals unless the US and Russia are working together. That's all there is to it. The second reason, the Republicans. The Republicans politicized national security in a, in a way that we rarely see. It wasn't all Republicans. Senator Luger was a partner in this. The, 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 the ranking member, then the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, was a partner in this effort to move, move the New Star Treaty to. But he was outflanked and outgunned by the resistance wing of the Republican Party, led by John Kyle, who then dragged the treaty out, exhausted the process, not just for the purpose of blocking the president's agenda, but for blocking any more arms control treaties, particularly the comprehensive test ban treaty that the Obama administration had sort of queued up. The plan was to quickly get a new start and then move on to the comprehensive test ban treaty. We never got there. Kyle's strategy worked. And in part, they wanted to deny the president of the United States, the Democratic president of the United States, a major foreign policy victory in 2010, an election year. They succeeded. They held it off until after the elections of 2010, and finally, and only then, did they approve it in a tough battle on the last day of the Senate. The Republicans then felt their oats as the president's attention wandered. The Republican attention didn't. They blocked every step the president wanted to take, including many of his appointees. This was trench warfare, hand-to-hand -hand combat. For those of you who haven't done this in Washington, it was brutal. There was nothing easy here. There was no simple step. There was no, oh, yeah, you sent me a letter. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think I'll just go do that now. Why did I think of that? No. This was tough, tough stuff. But the third reason is the reason I think it ultimately failed. Despite the Russians, despite the Republicans, it's the resistance he encountered from his own bureaucracy what I call the nuclear industrial complex. The nuclear industrial complex, including, and I hate to say this, some of his own appointees. The people he put in charge of implementing his vision, many of them never supported that vision. Many of them mocked his vision privately. So everything slowed down, everything dragged down, everything was a compromise. I gotta say, I do not know a defense official today who speaks out in favor of the president's vision. They go up to the Capitol Hill and they want more money for more weapons. At best, they give lip service to the president's agenda. But what they're really about is moving the money, moving the contracts, and this was the fatal flaw in the Obama strategy. As the policy faltered, the contracts raced on. Originally, seven years ago, it was all supposed to be, a, be part of a package. I will get arms reductions, and I will make sure, and he says this in Prague, that we will keep a safe, secure, and effective arsenal. In order to do that, you got to spend money. There's no way around it. And the truth was, the George W. Bush administration had neglected the nuclear complex. Those stories you hear about rainwater coming in, about floppy disks in our computers about deterioration of the nuclear weapons complex, they're all true. And there was a backlog of money that had to be spent just to fix this stuff, plus a promise to the senators 
you, you pass my New Star Treaty, and I'll support modernizing the force. This lovely word, modernizing the force. Who's against modernizing the force? We're all modern. <laughs> well, that modest modernization has turned into an avalanche of weapons that threatens to bury Obama's achievements. We have a new bomber. We have a new cruise missile for the bomber. We have a new submarine. We have new missiles for the submarine. We have new warheads for the missiles on the submarine. We have new fuses for the new warheads and the new missiles on the submarine. It goes on and on. We have a new MX missile. Oh, and on, I mean, a new uh, ICBM. And guess what? We don't just want to take the 450 ICBMs we have and replace them. No. Maybe we need a mobile ICBM. This is the latest thing coming out. A mobile ICBM. This was something we needed in the Cold War to survive the so-called window of vulnerability. And we're talking about a mobile ICBM again. These people are drunk on contracts. They're proposing everything, and everything is being given the green light. Everything. There is one weapon system inherited from George W. Bush that this president has stopped. He's added some. And this is the tragedy of this presidency, the tragedy of this promise. It's not too late. It is not too late for the president, for us, for the country, for the world. For those of you who have spent years working on this, thank you for your efforts. For those of you who are new to this, I congratulate you on your time. <laughs> Because you're coming in at a new policy moment. A new window is opening up for us. Similar to the window we had in 2007, 2008, 2009. Part of it is the budget pressures. I was supposed to talk about the trillion dollar triad. You know about the trillion dollar triad. You know this, all these weapons cost a trillion dollars over the next 30 years. But you may not realize that these were all planned when everybody was projecting that the defense budget was going to keep going up. Well, guess what? It's not going up. It's peaked. It's plateaued, what they call the inflection point. And now it's going down. So you got this wedge of unfunded programs moving through the future year defense budgets. You can't pay for these. Something's got to give. What's got to give? We have to force the choice. Because when the Joint Chiefs are forced to choose, they don't choose nuclear. They don't mind having these programs. You know, missile defense programs, sure, as long as the budget's going up, let's pay for missile defense. But when they have to choose, they choose the things the warriors need. The planes, the ships, the tanks, the things we actually need to fight the conflicts we're actually in. So this gives us a moment where we can, over the next two or three years, cut, cut these back, start to cur cur curtail this. We have heroes in the Congress that are helping us do this. Just this week, there was a letter from Maria Cantwell. She's the ranking member of the Senate Appropriations Committee in charge of these budgets from Washington State. If Washington State was an independent country, it would be the third largest nuclear power in the world. Yeah. There are over 1,000 nuclear weapons based in Washington State. Maria Cantwell is writing the letter Elizabeth's doubting me? I counted them. <laughs> I know, I saw you. Is that a thousand? <laughs> they're, they're in storage, in addition to the ones deployed. <laughs> Maria Cantwell writes a letter encouraging the president to do a number of things, including take that one-third reduction in nuclear weapons that the Joint Chiefs and the president said we could take and still accomplish all military missions to make a renewed effort to take this one-third cut. This is the next step that we have to get our leaders to take, and she's joined by Patty Murray, also from Washington. And she's joined by Al Franken, and she's joined by Jeff Merkley of Oregon, and she's joined by Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey from Massachusetts. <laughs> you have power that you don't realize. You've got to let them know, thank you. 
You better let them know there's political gain for them in doing the right thing, and doing the thing they want to do. Ed Markey's been a hero forever. Elizabeth Warren is now joining the cause. That's great. Work with them, help them, encourage them, support them. It's not so much they need your ideas, which they kind of sort of do. They need your political support. You got to create the political window, the political opening that allows them to do the right thing. We also have a political moment here, in addition to the budgetary pressures, both geopolitically and domestically. Geopolitically, I think Russia's, I think Putin might, in the next couple of years, decide for his own interests that he wants to re-engage with the United States again, and that one of the ways to re-engage is on the strategic issue. I, this is a, a state in decline. His gambits in Ukraine and Syria have not, have worked locally, but not globally. It hasn't helped him break the isolation that he's encountered. We're the ones with the global alliances. We're the one with the worldwide presence. We're the one with the biggest military in the world, the biggest economy, the biggest cultural influence in the world. He hasn't gained at all, hasn't made a dent in any of that. At some point, we're going to be ready to turn. We have to be ready to to put out the hand of negotiation, if not friendship, when they make that turn. When they make that turn. That's OK. That's OK. That's OK. That's OK. I just want to make one very, very clear. Okay. This is MIT. We're a very welcoming university. Okay. And this welcoming is built on respect. You respect people who support Linda LaRouche like you. Even if I don't, I respect your view. And this respect also extends to okay. never interrupting speakers. He's a warm up. Being, being respectful. That's all right. It's OK. I've been dealing with the LaRoucheite for 35 years. It's no big deal. Yeah, it's OK. Thank you. But we also have this domestic moment. If Donald Trump is the nominee of the Republican Party, I believe he will be, he is going to split the Republican Party. You have to go back to Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt and the Bull Moose Party to understand what might be happening here. This is not normal. Something dramatic is happening. And if that happens, it opens up all kinds of political possibilities, all kinds of liberal conservative alliances that could be possible in the next administration. And of course, we're also in a, in a political election year. Eight years ago, all of us who wanted to change U.S. nuclear policy were working with the campaigns to feed in ideas, to feed in people, to work on these things. This is what we have to be doing now, working with the campaigns, whatever party you're with, to feed in ideas, to feed in those, and get ready for next year when we can start to implement those ideas. We have a two-year window here, domestically, to move this agenda forward, where well, the new president can come in and take bold new steps. There are other, motion, other forces in motion, but I've taken too long, so I'm going to stop with just this final thought. I've, uh, I've lived in Washington for 35 years, but I used to live in Cambridge. <laughs> I was a community organizer in Cambridge. That's how I met Jonathan. We were doing tenant organizing in low-income housing. <clears throat> and before that, I was a student at Boston College. And you know what changed my life at Boston College? Meetings like this. Teach-ins on the Vietnam War. Small numbers of people, not the thousands we wanted. Talking, discussing, analyzing, teaching. Teaching us, telling us that we could stop this war that we knew was wrong politically morally, strategically wrong. And some of us thought it was impossible. But you know what? I've lived long enough to understand that when people say things are impossible, what they mean is that it's really hard. <laughs> I've, the impossible happens all the time. I've seen the people of Eastern Europe rise up and overthrow dictatorships that ruled them for generations. I've seen the Soviet Union collapse. I've seen Irish and Catholic in Northern Ireland that said, never, never, never unite, shake hands, and rule together. I've seen a man walk out of a prison cell that held him for 28 years 
to be elected the president of a free and majority world South Africa. Mm -hmm. I've seen the Red Sox win the World Series <laughs> three times. <laughs> so don't tell me this is impossible. It's just hard. Thank you very much.